Good day and thank you for joining us. Today's message on faith, hope and luck is a summary of a subject that we cover in depth in the Bikers Church Bible School. The material that we use in the Bible School was originally developed by Andy Stanley of North Point Community Church. But let's start the message by opening in prayer. Lord, I ask you to bless this message and I ask that you will enable me to bring this word correctly and that through your Holy Spirit you will help us to understand it and to apply it to our lives and that it will achieve whatever it is that you want. In a discussion on faith, a good starting point is to ask yourself, what is your faith based on? What is the true foundation of your faith? Because if that foundation is not settled and is not firm, your faith will be quite fragile and can actually change quite easily. Let me give two examples of ways in which that can happen. Let's say that you profess to be a Bible-believing Christian, but there is a known sin in your life. For example, you are living in sexual sin. Now you will feel convicted and you are likely to feel guilty because your lifestyle does not match your belief system. And because you don't want to feel guilty all the time, one of two things will happen. Either you will feel convicted and you will change your lifestyle, or your belief system will adapt to match your lifestyle and you will start saying things like, or thinking things like, well, that's not so bad. Everybody is really doing it. It's not really wrong. That kind of thing. So that your lifestyle then ends up determining what you believe because your belief system is inconvenient for the kind of lifestyle you, you want to live. Another example is, let's say uh, you've been brought up and you're, according to your value system, cheating and dishonesty is wrong. But now you work in a business environment where cheating and dishonesty is rife and where it's actually quite convenient to if you can't beat them join them then people might start to compartmentalize their lives unless that value system is very firm and settled and you may start thinking and doing things like well uh, cheating and dishonesty is wrong but that doesn't really apply in business or it doesn't really apply in sport. And something that many Christians seem to be able to convince themselves is that cheating and dishonesty is okay when it comes to your taxes. Another way, another, another area where your, if, if your value system and your belief system and the foundation of that isn't really firm and settled, where your faith can come crashing down around you, is when you are confronted with circumstances that you can't really explain. For example, you are a Christian or you know a real Bible believing servant of God and now something bad happens to that person or to yourself then you might start thinking but why didn't God protect him why didn't God protect me in this situation so if your value system and your belief system and your faith is based on your ability to understand and explain your circumstances then that faith is actually quite weak and quite fragile. In fact, it's not really different from the kind of faith that you'll find other people in the world exhibiting into people with other religions or even irreligious people. They also believe certain things and have a value system 
that they base things on. So how is biblical faith different then? And I think we can find one of the answers in Hebrews 4. Let me read to us from verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. So we see that biblical faith is different in the sense that it is faith in a person. Let me continue with Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. To understand biblical faith, it may be worth taking a look at what it is not. So biblical faith is not a power or a force or something that is separate from God. And it is certainly not something that you can do or use to force God to do something that he otherwise would not have done. That God didn't really want to do this, but because of your great faith, he ended up doing it. That's, that's not biblical faith. It's also not a question of just gritting your teeth and hanging on for dear life. And it is not just thinking positively or trying to believe something that you actually don't believe. None of those things is really biblical faith. The answer to what it is can be found in Hebrews 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So faith is a combination of hope and certainty. And that certainty, where does that come from? That certainty in biblical faith is based on the promises of God. So the promises of God is the bridge from hope to faith. Faith is not believing something that God has not promised. That is presumption. So if you act irresponsibly and now you think that because of your faith God should protect you, even though you are irresponsible, then that is quite presumptuous of you. That is not biblical faith in action. I think it would be helpful and I urge you to go and read Hebrews 11, the faith chapter in the Bible with lists of some of the heroes of the faith and their experiences. I think that will also provide you with a great insight into this matter. So what is faith then? A working definition of faith would be that it is a confidence that God is who he says he is and that he will do everything that he has promised to do. So it is confidence that God can do what you ask him to do and it is a confidence that God loves you and has your best interests at heart. So even if God ends up saying no, remember that you can still be confident that he is God and that he still loves you. Faith is also a gift. If we look at Ephesians 2 verse 8, it says that God actually supplies the faith that we need to be saved. And in many of the lists of gifts of the Holy Spirit, faith is listed as one of those gifts. Now I must say I find it quite comforting that it appears in many places in the Bible that God does not expect us to have perfect faith. Let me give you one example of that. In Mark 9, the father of a demon-possessed child comes to Jesus and asks Jesus to help him. And Jesus tells him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. 
Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So his faith wasn't perfect, but Jesus did go ahead and help him. We've said that the bridge from hope to faith is the promises of God and that you can rely on the promises that God has made. So then what are the promises that God has made? God has not promised healing for everyone. If you look at, for example, where Jesus heals the lame man at the bath in Bethesda, there were many sick and ill people around and he healed one of them. Jesus still heals today and he can heal, but he has not promised to heal everyone every time. God has also not promised to reverse the consequences of your bad decisions. Sometimes in his grace and mercy he does so, but sometimes he doesn't. And in fact, getting away with bad decisions is quite often bad for you. You find that people pray fervently when they are in the crisis, but once the crisis is passed, they just return to their old ways and habits and they don't even make a connection between what they pr they've prayed for and the resolution of the crisis. God has also not promised wealth to everyone. Many of the Old Testament saints, Abraham, Solomon, Job, were indeed very, very wealthy. But God has not promised that everyone will be or that you can just name it and claim it. If you look at that list of heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11, you'll find that many of them were quite poor and the apostles were quite poor. Which leads me to the last thing is that God has also not promised to keep bad things from happening to you. Again, looking at that list of heroes of the faith, people with great faith, many of them were actually martyred. Many of the New Testament saints were martyred. So there's no absolute promise that you'll live an easy life uh, if you have faith. So what has God promised? And probably the most important promise of all can be found in John 6, where Jesus says, The one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. A firm promise that if you go to Jesus to be saved, you will be saved. This promise is unconditional. It is a promise that's made to all people in all circumstances at all times. One of the firmest promises in the Bible. What else has God promised us? Let's look at Hebrews 4 again. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So we see mercy and grace. We will return to that. He will sometimes deliver you from trouble, but you can be certain that if he doesn't deliver you from the trouble, he will always deliver you through the trouble. He will be with you in the trouble. So for this, for mercy and grace, we can approach God boldly and with full confidence. To be clear, we can ask God for anything in the nature of a request, and we can hope that he will grant those requests. But if God has promised something, then you can be certain that he will live up to his promises. And one of the promises that he's made is the promise of grace and mercy. So you can expect God to show you grace and mercy every single time. So what if God is silent or says no? And here again we see the difference between mere hope and faith. Because hope is, here is what I would like God to do and I hope that he will do it. But faith is, here is what I would like God to do, and he has 
promised to do it so I can be certain that he will do it. You can have absolute faith and confidence when God has made a promise. But anything short of a promise in his word is simply hope. Now God often gives us what we hope for because he is loving and kind, but he always gives us what he has promised. When God is silent or says no, people often turn away from God and lose their faith. But what is the right reaction in a case like that? And that we can see in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul, one of the heroes of the faith, an apostle. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, the messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So God was silent for a period and Paul was really kept in the dark as to why he is having to go through this. And then the answer comes in verse 9 and the answer is no, but God specifically says that even though the answer is no, he will give him the grace to endure. So if God says no to us, we face a choice. We can either rebel and walk away from God, as many do, but then you also walk away from God's empowering grace. And then you have to handle the issue without God. As Philip Yancey says, the only thing worse than disappointment with God is disappointment without God, and things will get worse. The alternative is that if God says no, you lean into God. And things may not get better physically or in your circumstances, but you will receive the grace to endure it. We sometimes hear people talking about great faith. And what to me is quite interesting is if you look at the Bible and the history of heroes of the faith, great faith seems to equal great surrender. Look at, for example, Jesus in John 5. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself but him who sent me. And in John 6. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. If you believe that God is a loving Father, who knows best and can be trusted, why would you have your own agenda? Why would you not surrender to such a God? Not surrendering to such a God is illogical. Surrender and going His way is simply the logical way to live your life. And surrender can lead to more faith because it creates the circumstances, the condition in our hearts where the Holy Spirit can then come and bless us with more faith. 1 John 5 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So then the first question must surely be, what is it that God wants done? And we see similar, uh, a similar thought in John 14. So the question is, what does God want done in your life? in your finances, in your community, in your job, in your church. So find out what it is that God wants done and align with that. In Matthew 14, Jesus talks about faith that can move mountains. And if we apply this thinking, then surely the first question must be, does God want the mountain moved? Why? Don't people surrender to God? Why do we have our own plans? Why don't we really try to discern God's plan and get in line with that? And the reason is that 
Many people prefer a more manageable God or would actually only want God to be involved in certain areas of their life. They want to pick and choose where they want God to be involved, which certainly isn't the wisest thing to do. But now, what if you don't know what God's will is? In Luke 15, it says, While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So this leper believed that Jesus could make him clean, but he was uncertain whether he would. He hoped that he was willing. And that was apparently enough because Jesus healed him. Sometimes God is willing to do something now, sometimes he's willing later, and sometimes he's unwilling and says no for reasons we may actually never know. But God is still God even if he does not grant your request and you can still be certain that he loves you and that he has your best interests at heart. So here is the bottom line. We can ask God anything. He will answer many of our requests, even those that are not based on a specific promise. But he will answer all our requests that are based on his promises. Have you responded to God's most important promise yet? And then my question is, if you've not done so, why not? And I think there are basically two main reasons why people have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The one possibility is that you're really uncertain. You really don't know whether this whole thing is true. You hear Christians talking about it, but if you look at the way Christians live, it doesn't make all that much sense. And actually, you may not even know whether God really exists. You're really, truly uncertain whether you can believe this whole thing. That's the one possibility. And the other possibility is that even though you know it's true, you're simply unwilling to surrender because you want to be in control of your life. So if you're in the first category, the ones that are truly uncertain, then I have good news for you. God really doesn't mind. The important question is, what would you do if you were certain? Let's say something happens this moment and suddenly you are certain that God exists, that Jesus Christ is his son, that he loves you, that he died on the cross for you. If you are now absolutely truly certain of that, what would your reaction be? If you can honestly say, well, if I was certain of that, then I would accept him as Lord and Savior, and I would surrender my life to him, then you're almost there. Because then you can go to God and ask him to reveal himself to you and to convince you. And if you are honest, that you will then really, if you are convinced, surrender to Jesus, then you can expect God to reveal himself to you. A.W. Tozer says that he has done this with many people. And at the moment they were willing to say, okay, if I am truly certain of this, then I will surrender and accept Jesus. And in all those cases, those people came to saving faith. I would then also suggest that you go and read the Gospel of John with an open mind, go and read it a couple of times. And for many people, God has used that Gospel to, through the interaction with the Holy Spirit, to convince them of the truth of Jesus Christ as Savior. Just don't prescribe to God exactly how he should reveal himself to you, but you can expect that he will reveal himself to you. On the other hand, if you are in the other group, the ones who want to be in control, then my message to you is that you must realize that there is a major difference between wanting to be in control and actually being in control. I think over the past year, many people who thought that they were in control of things have seen that that was actually an illusion and that they were not really in control. So. If you know the truth, 
but you refuse to act on it because you do not want to surrender, because you want to be in charge of your life, then you're in quite a dangerous place. Because unlike the first person who can expect God to reveal himself to you, you already know the truth. And even if God should reveal himself to you, you've already decided that you're not going to listen. So why should God then bother to reveal himself to you? God keeps calling and his grace and his mercy is still available today. But it will not be available forever. And that is really something to think about. So on that possibly sad note, let me just end for us in prayer. Lord, I pray that for those people who are really uncertain whether this whole Christian thing is true, I pray that you will reveal yourself to them in an unmistakable way, that they will receive the absolute certainty that you exist, that you died on the cross for them, that you love them, and that they will come to a saving faith in you. For those who are simply unwilling to surrender to you because they want to be in control of their own lives, Lord, I ask that you would shake up their lives so that they will realize that they are not in control after all and that they really need you. And for the rest of us, I ask that you will enable us through your Holy Spirit to read and understand the promises that you have made to help us to live lives that are fully surrendered to you, that we will be productive in your service and that you will increase our faith. Amen. Thank you for listening.